Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lindy Lee, and I'm absolutely honored to have with me today Dr. Valerie Arcouche. She is a longtime member of our community and currently serves as chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners, and she was unanimously elected. Prior to her stellar career in public service, she was also a doctor and was served as professor at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. She also led a nationwide coalition of doctors who put their patients before profits and they advocated for much needed reform. Again, we are so honored to have her with us today and look forward to hearing her story. Thanks, Thank Wendy. you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Such an honor. So, as I mentioned before, you had decades of experience in medicine and an amazing career. What inspired you to enter public service as well? My patients inspired me to enter public service. When I was practicing medicine, which I did for a little over 20 years, I worked mainly in teaching hospitals and I was an anesthesiologist that specialized in obstetrics. So I spent a lot of time with my patients. It can take a long time to have a baby. And over the years, I came to see so clearly that my patients were facing challenges that impacted their health that I couldn't fix as a doctor. So I took care of a lot of moms that uh, struggled to get access to healthy food. Many of them lived in neighborhoods that didn't have grocery stores. Um, many of them had challenges with getting to jobs that paid a living wage. Uh, many were insecure in their housing, and the list went on and on. And these were things that are just so fundamental to our health, and there's no prescription uh, for food. You know, there's no surgery that you can do to make the environment cleaner around someone's home. So I decided to go back to school and get a master's in public health and have since then been working in health policy and, and now in elected office. Right, and you studied at Hopkins and Northwestern. Yes, my undergraduate degree is from Northwestern University. That was a degree in economics. My dad was a small business owner, and even though I wanted to go to medical school from a very, very young age, I thought it would be helpful to know a little bit about business and economics. And I went to the University of Nebraska College of Medicine. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska. And then I got my public health degree at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And you were able to leverage your economics degree at Northwestern for the benefit of our community. Could you tell us more about that and the work that you did um, from an economic standpoint to help Montgomery County? Montgomery so County's been um, really undergoing quite an interesting story over the last six years. Uh, the administration changed hands back in 2012. A new administration came in, was led by uh, our now Attorney General, Josh Shapiro, and he and uh, his fellow commissioner at the time, Leslie Richards, walked into a situation where the county was in a very, very difficult financial situation. They literally had to uh, borrow money to make the first payroll. The county was so depleted of funds. Wow. And over that next uh, year to 18 months, Moody's, the bond rating agency, downgraded the county's bond rating twice for a whole variety of reasons. I was part of the transition team that came in to look at how the county was doing business and where improvements could be made and how we could better serve our constituents. And a number of suggestions from our transition committee were implemented. Uh, in the early days, and then in 2015, after the departure of Leslie Richards, I became one of the commissioners and continued down that path. So now I'm very happy to say that uh, Moody's has restored the county's bond rating to AAA status. Thank you very much. And we've done that by just w what I hope was made a lot of smart decisions. We've right-sized the county's workforce, we've integrated departments so we don't have the same people doing the same things from different offices. Uh, we actually have a smaller county workforce than we did back in 2012. How we much also smaller? have a smaller county budget than we did back in 2012. About 300 people or so. We have a smaller budget, we have less debt, but we've done all that by increasing services to our constituents. So we haven't come in and cut things. We've tried to streamline processes, make things more efficient, and make it much easier for people to access services. So we've actually increased the input of services to Montgomery County residents. That's amazing, and I love how, um, you know, not only are you showing up the finances in Montgomery County, you're also bringing your medical background to bear. For example, can you tell us more about your outstanding, outstanding work in bringing down the number of deaths in Montgomery County as a result of the opioid epidemic? Not, deaths not only from pills, but generally speaking as well. 
So one of my passions has been to combat the opioid epidemic, which is present in Montgomery County, present across Pennsylvania, and present across the United States. And I've brought a public health approach to fighting this disease. And that's probably the most important message is that substance use disorder is a disease. And so if you approach this problem like you would approach any disease, you can actually beat it. So it's not easy, but you can take steps and put things and processes in place to help. So any type of addiction is a chronic disease, and it's a disease that can be treated. It's a disease that will have relapses, just like somebody with diabetes might decide to go out and have an ice cream sundae one night and get that blood sugar spike. But again, it's a disease that can be treated. So we've brought together multiple stakeholders, both inside and outside of the county government. Uh, we're working very closely with law enforcement. We do a lot of public education in our schools as well as in our community. We've educated the medical community about prescribing. Uh, we've worked closely with law enforcement in a couple of ways. One, they are working very hard to catch dealers, so to get those folks off the street. And then every police officer in Montgomery County is carrying naloxone. Naloxone is a medication that can reverse an opioid overdose. And we have 50 municipal police departments in our county. And working together with our district attorney, Kevin Steele, we convinced every one of them to carry naloxone, which was a big deal because they don't report to us. They report to their municipal uh, elected officials. But they're all doing it now. And to give you a sense of the impact, in 2017, our police alone, so not any of the um, EMS, you know, uh, any of the emergency, normal emergency responders, just our police gave naloxone 367 times wow. and 97 percent of those people survived. So that just gives you a sense of how important it is having this medication everywhere in the community. Too. Yeah, very effective. And those are people that now have the opportunity to get into treatment. You know, once someone has passed away from an opioid overdose, that's it. There's no hope for treatment. Right. Would you say that the opioid epidemic is one of the biggest challenges facing our county today? Uh, it definitely is. It's a, it's a disease that affects literally every neighborhood in the county. We have some uh, really interesting maps that are available on our website that show where uh, people have overdosed, where police and others have given Narcan. And what is your website? And that can all be found at montcopa.org. And we also have there all kinds of resources to how to get connected to treatment. So that's sort of part two, is once somebody survives an overdose, we're working to create what's called a warm handoff, which is to get that person into treatment. And sometimes we do that through taking them to an emergency room. Um, sometimes the person's just willing to go on their own. But we're working very hard to encourage people to get into treatment. And we have, compared to a lot of other places, we, we never have enough treatment resources, but compared to a lot of other counties, we have more treatment resources available than a lot of places. So we've been pretty successful in getting people into treatment. That's phenomenal what you're doing, and I think it's reassuring for a lot of the residents of Montgomery County to have somebody like you at the helm, someone who has a medical background, who knows that mental illness has to be destigmatized. In that vein, how has being a doctor helped you become a better public servant? Well, I think there's a couple of different ways. Um, one, as a doctor, you learn how to listen to people, and so I work really hard to just listen. I think. Um, if you really hear people and, and really understand what their concerns are, then that is the most important thing that you can do as an elected leader, to make sure you understand where somebody's com coming from, what their real concerns are, and then you can use that to try to uh, work into some kind of a poli policy solution if, if that's appropriate. So I think being a good listener has been very helpful. Um, I make decisions based on data. I spent a whole career uh, making decisions on, on every type of treatment for patients by using data. And that could be lab data, x-rays, uh, information from the scientific literature. I take that same approach in making decisions about our government. So I ask a million questions. I want to see data. I want to see data trends. Um, I want to make an informed decision, not just one that's from the seat of my pants. And I'm also very used to working in collaboration with others. So. Um, with a rare exception of maybe a, a primary care doctor doing sort of a routine visit with a patient, 
doctors work with other doctors from multiple specialties to take care of patients. In my specialty of anesthesiology, I always worked with other doctors, you know, surgeons, obstetricians, other specialists. So I'm very used to working collaboratively, and I'm also very used to having to negotiate a situation where people didn't agree on what the next step should be. So I know how to do that. I spent my whole career doing that. And um, I'm very, very used to and very practiced at getting people to agree to some kind of consensus on how to move forward. Because when you're taking care of a person, you have to get to consensus before you can take that next step. And I use that same approach in my governing. So try to find a data-informed answer and then try to get consensus around that. So prior to your public service career, you were a doctor of medicine. Now you're kind of a doctor of society in a way. It feels like that some days. Definitely. What are some of the other challenges facing Montgomery County? Well, government has some really fundamental roles, and I think one of them is infrastructure. So Montgomery County owns about 130 bridges and 70 miles of roads. And when this administration came in in 2012, there were 62 bridges that were called structurally deficient. So that can mean a lot of different things. Some of them were so bad they were closed. Others had weight restrictions on them, which could mean that a fire truck or a school bus could not go over them. So particularly in an emergency situation, that could have pretty serious consequences. Um, these bridges were just sort of languishing in disrepair, and so it became a priority to get these bridges fixed. So I'm now very happy to tell you that 82% of the 62 that were structurally deficient are either fixed or in the process of being fixed. Wow. So we have 18 that are fixed, and then we have 32, 33 others that are in the process of being fixed. So we're getting there. It's a long process. Fixing bridges is very expensive and can take a really long time. But I know we must be doing something right because now people are complaining that there's too much construction going on in the county. It used to be they complained that there wasn't enough. So Good people are always going to complain, but I'd rather have them exactly. complain that we're doing too much rather than too little. And you have quite a vibrant social media presence as well. And in regard to infrastructure, I know they are also opening up areas of Montgomery County to just recreation and mm -hmm. public trails. I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that, please? Yeah, our trail system in Montgomery County is one of the things that our residents value the most. So we have county-owned about 100 miles of trails, and then they uh, connect in many cases to municipal trail systems. We're also part of something called the Circuit Trail, which is an effort to build um, it's, I think it's a close to a thousand miles of trails that'll connect the eastern seaboard. And so some of some very critical connections go through Montgomery County. And then we're part of something called the 9-11 Trail, which is a proposed trail that would connect the three sites of impact on 9-11. So New York, Shanksville, and Washington, D.C. So we are constantly building new trails. And I love trails because I think one of the ways that we help people in our community be healthier is to make the healthy choice the easy choice. So if you live really close to a trail, it's so easy to, after work, go out, take a walk, hop on your bike, go for a run, get your kids, uh, whatever works for you. But if you have to drive 10 miles to get to that trail, you're probably not going to do it. So we're trying to make trails close by and accessible to just about everybody in Montgomery County. We just launched something called Bike Monco, which is a proposal to build a bunch of critical bike connections around the county. And people can take a look at that on our website also at moncopa.org. Thank you. And we've already talked about a number of your accomplishments and the milestones. What are you proudest of? Um, I think I'm proudest of the fact that I lead a government that actually works on behalf of the constituents in Montgomery County. We've been able to get our fiscal house in order. We've been able to get our infrastructure on its way to repair. Uh, we also provide a number of public safety uh, initiatives for our constituents. The county runs the 911 call center. And we have used technology in a lot of really innovative ways to help boost public safety. So one of the things that we've implemented is that you can now text 911. Really? Yeah. So if you're wow. in a Montgomery County cell tower, you can uh, type 911 into your text uh, 
space and it will text to 911 and the telecommunicator on the other end will respond by text and the whole conversation can be by text. That's so really innovative. It is. So if you're in a situation where you're afraid to make a phone call or maybe you're someone who's speech impaired and finds it difficult to speak, now you can text. We've also got an app called PulsePoint and PulsePoint is a free app that you can download and if you know basic CPR, you just register your name and if someone within a quarter mile of your location uh, needs CPR, it has a cardiac arrest in a public location, so you won't get sent to anybody's home, but they're say at a shopping mall or something like that, the app notifies you that someone close to you needs CPR. And sometimes that might mean that you could get to the person a little more quickly than the ambulance can, and every minute that someone gets CPR, so once cool. their heart has stopped beating, dramatically increases their survival rate. So we've done some really fun, innovative things. There's a couple other ways that we've used technology um, to help people uh, access services. The people can go online now and register their house and let us know if they have pets or if they have an elderly relative that might need help evacuating the house, things like that. Wow. So if, the, if there's a fire, when the fire uh, department is notified, they'd be told that, oh, then there's two dogs in that house, if you could look for two dogs. So a lot of different ways that we're trying to make our public safer. That's fantastic. I love how you're harnessing the power of technology to make government even yeah. better. So you've been doing outstanding work. Thank Where you. do you see yourself in the short term, in five years, or in the longer term? Well, I'm up for re-election next year in 2019, and I'm planning to run for re-election, and it is a four-year term. I have a couple of things that I really would hope to see through in that next term. One of the biggest ones, which perhaps many of your um, viewers have heard about, is expansion of the King of uh, the Norristown High Speed. Mm -hmm high-speed rail line out to King of Prussia. So that will make a huge difference for anyone who lives anywhere near the Norristown high-speed rail line. So all across Lower Marion, uh, both out to King of Prussia or into the city. The goal is to build a spur off the rail line. It will add five miles of new track out to Upper Marion. There will be several stops out there ending at the Valley Forge Casino. So anyone could get on in the Lower Marion area along that line and be out in Upper Marion in very, very short order. Right now, the only way to get out there is by some kind of vehicle, either a bus or a car. And the roads going out that way are, are pretty crowded right now. Upper Marion is now the third largest job center in our region. So Center City, University City, and Upper Marion are wow, the three. Wow, yeah. did not know that. And there's 60,000 jobs out there right now and uh, there's more being created every day. CHOP just announced that they're going to build their first hospital outside of the main hospital in West Philadelphia in King of Prussia. They have a specialty outpatient center there now and they're going to start construction probably within about a year on a 52-bed hospital that'll be right there next to their current building. So a ton going on out there. So I view uh, one of my jobs is to help make sure people can actually get there mm -hmm. and that the workforce is there for um, those businesses. So that's one thing. Second thing is we're also working on a, our county seat in Norristown. And we're going to be uh, doing some work on our main building that we uh, are housed in currently, which has got surrounding sca uh, scaffolding surrounding it because the building has some real structural issues. So we're going to we're starting to fix that building this summer, and then once that's done in 2020, we hope to break ground on a new courthouse justice center. So we have a modern set of courtrooms. Um, and another thing I'm very, very committed to is making sure that we have the right workforce in Montgomery County so we continue to grow. Montgomery County has one of the lowest unemployment rates of any county in the Commonwealth and also one of the highest average wages of any county in the Commonwealth. We have the most manufacturing jobs, almost 45,000 manufacturing jobs in Montgomery County. We have the most manufacturing jobs of any county in the Commonwealth. But they're all high-tech jobs, and they require workers that have a certain skill set. So we're working very closely with uh, not only our Montgomery County Community College, but all of the other colleges and universities in the county to encourage them to train people or educate people with the kinds of skills that these businesses need. We are already a net importer of workers every day. People come into Montgomery County. More people come into Montgomery County to work every day than leave it. And so we need to make sure that we've got that workforce of the future so that businesses want to continue to come to move into Montgomery County and grow once they get here. So how often do you communicate with the residents of Montgomery County? Well, that's um, always an interesting challenge, actually. Um, so we, we take every opportunity available to us. 
So um, first of all, we have a meeting twice a month, a public meeting, and that meeting is live streamed on the internet, and then and it's also recorded, and then we post that recording. So if somebody can't watch the meeting in real time, it is in the middle of the workday, they can always go online and watch it later. Uh, five times, or every spring, we go out f to four or five different places around the county and hold what's called conversations with the commissioners. So they're basically our equivalent of town halls. So we just actually finished. Um, we did four this year in four different locations around the county. And every year we try to mix up the locations a little bit to get people, you know, give people a relatively easy opportunity to come and listen. And we, uh, this year, uh, did Facebook Live during every one of those conversations. And so not surprisingly, we actually had more people on Facebook Live watching than we did in the room. Makes but sense. that's great. I mean, yeah. how, whatever it takes you know, to get folks to, to listen, it's great. Uh, we do a fair amount of social media. So the county has uh, multiple Twitter feeds, you know, different departments in the county. I also love your own. own tweets. I love your own And then Twitter I have feed. my own. My fellow commissioners have their own. Um, the county has a Facebook page. I have my own Facebook page. And then there's emails and, you know, kind of some more traditional communications. I think one of our biggest challenges of late has been that our local media has just been decimated. All of our local papers have been bought up by one of these big conglomerate uh, for-profit owners, and they are laying off most of the reporters. Oh, no. So it's really, it's a tragedy because I, I just don't know how our community is going to be able to keep track of all the things that we're, not only we're doing, but their local school boards or local municipal governments. Um, it's tough to have those public checks and balances if it's really difficult for the public to even know what their government is doing. So um, I'm happy to have someone watching what I'm doing, and I'm finding it incredibly frustrating that we don't always have a reporter at our meetings anymore because there's mm -hmm. just not enough to go around. I know that you're a role model for not only women who aspire to do something in the civic arena, but men as well. And um, in that regard, what is the best piece of advice for, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? And how have you become so accomplished? What is your secret sauce? Well, I think um, the best piece of advice I've ever received and the one that I have always given to people when asked is to follow your passions. And what I mean by that is that I think a lot of people, when they're first starting out in their careers, they, they might um, take a job because they believe that it will ultimately pay more or um, maybe there's more job availability in a specific field but in their heart of hearts, they'd actually rather be doing something else. And I think it's so important, as, as best you can, to try to follow that passion. Because if you're doing what you're passionate about, you'll always be good at it, because you care about it. And there's always jobs for people who are good at what they do. So I think following your passion is so important. And then the second piece of that, which I guess applies to me in some ways, is if that passion takes you down an entirely different and unexpected path, you know, be open to that possibility. And so in my case, I just always wanted to help take care of people. And so I did that in a very traditional way as a physician. But then I started to see that um, for some of the things that I cared about, like homelessness and food insecurity and making sure people had access to good jobs, I couldn't really do that as a doctor. And so I went back to school and got some additional training and have taken sort of everything I did as a doctor and now combined it with this new skill set to try to work on these other issues that ultimately will help make people healthier. They'll help create healthy communities. They take a little longer to do than prescribing an antibiotic for an infection, but in many ways they're more lasting and will truly I think help create down the road uh, a whole generation that's healthier and that's that's just really one of my goals. Absolutely and as we close out today I also just want to share with our viewers that about three to four years ago when I first reached out to you you had no idea who I was you agreed to take a meeting and that meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. You're a very busy woman obviously but you still took time out to have lunch and I think that just speaks volumes about the type of person you are, and I'm never going to forget that. No, well, thank you. So thank you. I hope you know how much I appreciated that. Any final last words? Um, I just encourage people to, um, you know, really follow their dreams and, and work hard and, and believe that you can accomplish a lot if, if you put your mind to it. 
And uh, if people don't know a lot about their Montgomery County government, I find that people just don't know much about what county government does, to take a look at our website, which is moncopa.org, and, and learn a little bit about it. Absolutely, and I know that all of us are grateful to have you as our leader, and you're making a tremendous mark on our community. Thank so you. thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for watching the latest episode of Listening with Lindy Lee. Again, we are incredibly honored to have Dr. Valerie Arkush with us. She is the chair of the Montgomery County Board of Commissioners. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You are watching Radnor Studio 21, an arts, educational, and entertainment station proudly serving the main line and greater surrounding area.